Hey, I'm Drew, and you are watching or just listening to The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery. So if you're struggling with things like agoraphobia or panic disorder, this is the place for you. I'm happy you're here. Today, we're going to talk about hypnosis. Does hypnosis have a place in anxiety recovery? I have a special guest who's going to help me answer that question. So let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 232. We are recording in early November of 2022. Today, we're going to answer the question, is there a place for hypnosis in anxiety recovery? It's a good question. It gets asked all the time because I know many of you are sometimes marketed to by hypnotists and hypnotherapists who say that hypnosis is an anxiety cure or a fix for anxiety disorders. Is that true or not? Well, I asked my friend Emma Garrick to join me today on the podcast. You know, may know Emma on Instagram as the dot anxiety whisperer. Uh, Emma is tops. She's well trained. She's ethical. She's a good person. She's a friend of mine. I trust her. Emma is a qualified psychotherapist and also a clinical hypnotherapist practicing in Scotland. So she gave us a really great overview of how hypnosis can fit into the process, what it is supposed to do, what it definitely does not do, how to have realistic expectations, and how to be a critical consumer of hypnosis if you choose to include that as part of your approach to recovery. So before we bring on bring Emma on, and she was great, you guys are going to dig this, just a quick reminder that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode uh, or this video if you're watching on YouTube. There's a ton of stuff that I have for you at theanxioustruth.com. That's my website. You should go check it out. There are three books that I've written on anxiety and anxiety recovery that are being read by tens of thousands of people around the world, and I'm really proud of those. Check them out. There is a free one-hour Anxiety 101 video training that you will find linked on the homepage of my website. There is my free morning newsletter, which is called The Anxious Morning. That's on the website. There is the Distress Tolerance webinar I do every month with Joanna Hardis. She's an anxiety specialist practicing in Ohio. Uh, you'll find that information on the website, all the other free podcast episodes, all the social media content. It's all there. Check it out at theanxioustruth.com. And if you are enjoying this podcast and you find my work helpful and you want to find a way to keep it free, of advertisers and sponsors. All the way to do that can be found at the anxious truth.com slash support. That is never required, but always appreciated. No matter how you support the podcast, whether it's just listening or giving a thumbs up on a video, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for all of that. So let's get on to the chat with Emma. We went for about 30 minutes. It's packed full of great information. I learned a whole lot. You guys are going to dig it. And I will come back afterwards with links and a wrap up. You know how it works. Hello, Em. Welcome. Hi there, G. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, Emma, for those of you who do not know Emma, Emma Garrick, Emma is a psychotherapist in Scotland and just a lovely human being. We did a lot oh. of work about a year ago together and then we just sort of lost touch. So it's very nice to be connected with you again and be working together. So yeah, it's nice to drift into each other again. Once in a while, every once a year, whether we need it or not. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. So as I mentioned in the uh, intro, Emma is a qualified psychotherapist. Emma is also a hypnotherapist. And if I use the wrong terms, please jump in and correct me, right? You, you have qualifications as a hypnotherapist. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm a now, clinical, I, clinical hypnotherapist. Okay. I want to talk about that because I don't know what that is. And I need you to explain because I think this is going to mm -hmm. be a really important discussion here. The okay. reason why I asked you on, and we were talking like this, I'll look behind the curtain. We did talk about this before we hit the record button, but I know many people in the community want to know, what about hypnosis? Is that a therapy? And they want to know because hypnotists, I don't know the difference between a hypnotist and a hypnotherapist. Maybe you could tell me that. I don't know. Often will say, oh yeah, I, I treat anxiety. I, I treat weight loss and smoking cessation and addiction and relationships. And a hypnosis is applied to everything. Mm -hmm. So they often get approached by practitioners that will say, oh yeah, yeah, I, I do anxiety. And they want to know, is that work? Yeah. And I said, I yeah. got to go to somebody I trust here and that would be M. So. <laughs> Okay. So give me the Reader's Digest version here. Hypnotist, clinical hypnotherapist, uh -huh. hypnotherapist, what does it all mean? Well, it's an interesting one because uh, hypnotherapy is the act of performing the therapy. Hypnotists, you get stage hypnotists, which is what we see in the likes of Paul McKenna, I think. 
He's okay. one, isn't he? Yeah. We see stage hypnosis. And for some people, I think when they think of hypnotherapy, that's kind of what they're thinking about is this, you know, I'm somebody's going to make me perform like a monkey. Mm -hmm. And then you get lots of different branches of people who practice hypnosis. And for the most part, um, in psychotherapy, which is where we are, um, we will see people who are trained in maybe clinical hypnotherapy, or they might be trained in Ericksonian um, hypnotherapy, or they might be trained in a few other um, approaches. Mm -hmm. But for me, clinical hypnotherapy is my background, and that's what I've always practiced. Um, some practices of hypnotherapy are standalone in that that will be the treatment modality that that person will only practice however for the likes of somebody like a psychotherapist we might be trained in a hypnotherapy we might be trained in a an emdr we might be trained in um cbt we might be trained in lots of different disciplines and modalities mm -hmm. and we will pull that all together as an approach for anxiety so or whatever you might be treating a depression or um ptsd whatever it might be so there are differences in terms of um styles of hypnotherapy that you can be seeing advertised as a consumer mm -hmm. and um there are also different training programs that the hypnotherapist will undertake in order to become qualified as a hypnotherapist and I think what you and I were talking about just a short time ago was the fact that there's some sort of confusion out there um, probably in terms of um, how hypnotherapy can be marketed really yes. for people who have anxiety. Yeah yeah so and for people that you know we're talking to with panic disorder, agoraphobia, OCD, hypochondriasis, all of those things. Yes. The way it's marketed to them is in many times, I think as a standalone modality, hypnosis yeah. treats the disorder. Yeah. And it's kind of pitched as that it's kind of pitched as hypnosis will be the thing that helps you cure this problem that you have. Yeah. And I think that's where you had approached me was to kind of have a conversation with you about well where are we with this what what actually does that mean yeah. so i just want to go back a wee bit because i'm all one for sort of laying foundations and mm -hmm. putting a bit of the the history together for well where does hypnosis actually come from what is it that we're actually talking about here when we're talking about hypnosis um, and we'll we'll weave in maybe a wee bit about you know how the training and what people need to be mindful of when they're looking for a practitioner if it's something that they then decide that they want to experiment as part of their recovery with because yeah. in my mind and I'll be upfront hypnosis is a great therapy okay so um but there are limitations with it and I want to be clear about what the expectation should be from a consumer's perspective in terms of when they go hunting or they're approached by somebody who is offering this as a um, solution for their anxiety. So Hypnos was the god of sleep and hypnos is, uh, hypnosis has just sort of derived from there. There was actually a Scottish doctor who was one of the first champions of hypnosis. Um, it usually involves uh, using a lot of suggestions that will help induce a state of relaxation and calmness. And we use a lot of imagery and um, interweaved in there, there will be a lot of suggestions which are made towards the subconscious element of our minds to help us alter our behaviors and our patterns of thinking and our emotional state and some of our behaviors. Yes. So when I'm talking to you just now, Drew, the very conscious part of your mind, this part here is listening to me, it's watching my face, it's reading my eyes, it's very, very aware of what's happening between you and I in this conversation. But then there's another subconscious part in your brain that is probably maybe quite enjoying the sound of my voice or is thinking actually it's quite nice to catch up with her I've not seen her in quite a while and it's not necessarily 
you know, listening to everything that I'm saying, but it may be getting a bit soothed and a bit calmed by the way that I'm talking, Mm -hmm. the tone that I'm using, and maybe just some of the suggestions that I'm making about you becoming a bit more relaxed, right? And this is... (laughs) And this is the... This this is the beauty of uh, um, a hypnotherapy session is that quite quickly we can make suggestions about how people could be feeling and we can use certain um, tones and pauses and how we're going to induce a state of relaxation. And when we're doing that, there are certain parts of our brain that start to respond. And we know this because we can measure this and we do this using certain scanning techniques. So we've done a lot of imaging. There was an amazing bit of research that was published this year and um, they were looking at the functional changes in brain activity when people have used hypnosis. So they did a massive sample um, of about 10,000 pieces of research and they basically concluded that yes there are significant changes that happen in lots of different places in the brain and so when we're looking at anxiety for instance the areas that correlate with activity when we're anxious Mm -hmm. so all of the overactivity that's happening in certain regions um that actually gets interrupted and actually starts to calm down and we also know that the region of our brain which is um, responsible for helping our parasympathetic nervous system which is our the system that we want to kick in to drive is also um, activated which is basically going to help us with our breathing and our heart rate Mm -hmm. and it's going to relax the muscles in our body so for hypnosis to be um, effective we need to make sure that we are in the 10% of people who can be hypnotized. That's a fascinating statistic. Right? Yeah. Not everybody is open to suggestion. Not everybody is a willing participant in hypnosis. And I think there's this preconception and there's certainly nothing that I see very obviously in marketing material that says, if you're one of the lucky 10%, hypnosis might work for you. No, no one ever says that. I I have so much respect for the fact that you said out loud on a pretty big podcast, 10%. It's actually mm-hmm. a low number. I did not expect it to be that low. Yeah, because when you think about it, one of the one of the biggest, um, I suppose one of the biggest fears that a lot of people have with something like hypnosis is that they're going to come and there's going to be this loss of control because you're handing control over to somebody else. And we're talking about our brain. And when we've got an anxiety, as you know, like in a generalized anxiety, or we've got maybe some OCD or something, and we, we're maybe a bit um, magical thinking kick, can kick in for a lot of us. Yeah. And we worry, we can worry about, you know, the effect that some of these things are going to have on us. Even people with health anxiety, we mm. worry about taking medication. We're worrying about what's going on in here as well. Yeah, And I think one of the the barriers to um, hypnosis is this fear of the loss of control. But one of the best things to remember is that actually only 10% of us can ever be hypnotized anyway. That's amazing. You've got to be, you've got to be a willing participant in this process. But again, when you think about it, you've got to be a willing participant in any recovery process for for, for any type yeah. of anxiety recovery to be effective. You've got to play your part in this. Yep. I, yeah. I'm wondering, that's such a good statistic, but I'm, I'm wondering in a population of people and in, in any sort of mental health issue, clearly people are looking for improvement. That's not news. But in our population where people are sometimes really desperate to just feel better, does that make them a little bit more open to that? Like, I'm, I really want this to work. Will that make a difference, do you think, in your experience? Yeah, I think it will do. But I think what I see is that you get the people who are so desperate for it to work that they hand over a lot of responsibility to the practitioner. And then when it's not working, they start to lose hope. Yeah. So I think there's an obligation on the 
part of the clinician to make sure that those people know that this isn't failing because of anything that they are doing or yeah. anything that the clinician may be doing, there's a high chance and probability that they're just not in the, the 10%. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I'm not an expert on this subject area, so I don't want to get too, too um, bogged down in it, but it's mm -hmm. like recently all of the um, news that surfaced about SSRIs or antidepressants, you know, we don't really know how they work. Right. But there was research that was also done recently, which compared, which was looking at the, um, the effectiveness, I suppose, of hypnotherapy with, I, I, in comparison to benzodiazepines in terms of inducing that state of relaxation. And they found yeah. that they kind of were the same. I'm not surprised by that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that. It's a great. That's it's very interesting. Okay. Very interesting. So, well, here's where I think, and this is great. This is great information. I'm actually learning a lot here. I, I, I'm happy if no one listens and I just listen. So I think people are hopeful. What I hear most of the time is, will it stop my panic attacks? When I, you know, is it, will it give me tools? How, how does it work? Like, will somebody teach me something or, or somehow put me in a state of hypnosis that will calm me down and make me not panic anymore, make me not afraid of cancer anymore? What is the answer? To I know, I know what you're going to say. What I would say is, yes, a little bit but probably it's not going to do all of that mm -hmm. okay it's absolutely a tool that you can turn to to help you regulate your nervous system it's absolutely a tool that you can help to get you out of that really intense wound up my brain's going 90 miles an hour i feel incredibly panicked at the moment it's not going to switch off a panic attack yeah it's not going to do that yeah um it's it's going to help you to probably pave the way for you to learn how to look after yourself as part of your recovery from that type of disorder. Yeah. And um, it's, it's a useful thing to learn for yourself. It's a useful tool to add to a, a toolkit. Right. When we, yeah, when we first met and you mentioned hypnosis to me, the thing, the thing that stuck in my head is, well, sometimes I find it useful as a tool in therapy. It can help mm -hmm. people relax enough to be able to face the panic and do the exposures. And that stuck yeah. in my head. Like, wow, that makes a whole lot of sense. That's not what I've ever yeah. heard before. That makes so much sense. Yeah. So yeah. when you're, when, as you and I both know, because we've both been there with our anxiety, mm -hmm. pretty heightened at times, when your head is, going around like a washing machine out of control yeah. and when your body is jumping around with lots of um, different symptoms you want anything to work mm -hmm. you just want something to work you just want something to help you and hypnotherapy can help if you find something that your amygdala responds to and this is why i think my reputation became quite popular because I, I happen to have quite a pleasant voice so that other people tell me this, by the way, I'm not, not telling concerned. myself this. And people would say to me, mother's just something about your voice that I like. And I, I turn it on when I'm feeling really anxious. And the reason I think for that is because there, there is a quality in some of the um, instruments that some of us are gifted with. Okay. And it's not that um, lots of people can practice hypnosis and lots of people can benefit from hypnotherapy, but there are certain reasons why some hypnotherapists are get more results than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And I think the thing is, when you're in a state, a heightened state of panic, or you're just in a heightened state with intrusive thoughts or whatever might be happening in, in your world at that time, if you can go to something familiar, something that can calm you and something that can soothe you, 
there isn't a replacement for that. There's not a generic something. There's something about that that helps your brain feel relaxed and at ease. And that can sometimes for some people be gold. Yeah. But you've got to find what that thing is in a voice or in an instrument that you're listening to. Yeah. No, that that makes such good sense. That, and you know what I'm loving about this? There's I'm not hearing any crazy promises of it. Oh, and that calms you right down. Now, and I always use this phrase, navigation, not eradication. And this seems mm-hmm. like an excellent navigation tool if you can key into it and it works for you. Yeah. But I'm, yeah, but I'm also hearing, which, oh, I forgot to turn that off. Um, what I am also hearing, which is interesting, is maybe I'm not. So now I'm, I'm a client and I'm in your therapy room. Maybe I'm mm-hmm. not the 10% for whom that's effective. But it Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the way you conduct yourself in session and the way you talk to me might not achieve similar effects. Am I right in sort of leaning that from what you're talking about here? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, We, (laughs) I've had some of the most resistant people in front of me who clearly I can tell they're not going to really respond very well to hypnosis, right. but they respond well to me. Yeah, I could see that. We talk yeah. all the time about how it's so the ther- the, your relationship with the therapist and finding somebody that you connect with is so important. And this could be part of that. I get that. Absolutely. It's a massive yeah. part of trust and building that rapport and having somebody sit in front of you who is empathetic mm-hmm. to what is happening to you. Yeah. Paves a runway that lasts for a very long time if you are needing some kind of um, reassurance, which I know is not what we would offer, but oh, reassurance but... and soothing and comfort. Yeah, so but I even think... if the... I'm sorry, I, might, I stepped on you there. No. What I was going to say is e- even, even though I know we don't want to offer reassurance, I get that. And it's not necessarily about, well, come to me and I'll soothe you. But, and I say this all the time, when my brain is telling me that this is urgent, one of the things I really need is it somebody to reflect back? It's really not. It's really not urgent. And some, and I, I, any of all who are listening who like to say that I calm you down, I don't know how you can listen to Emma talk and then say I calm you down. I don't know how that would be. But I could see that. <laughs> I where love you, your voice. So. Well, you would be ideally suited though. Like mm-hmm. I might reflect that back. To me, it's, I'm going to give you a bit of a confident shoulder shrug. Like I know you think you're burning, but I promise eh, this is not a problem. Your way to do mm-hmm. it might be a little bit different the voice, the mannerisms, and I could see where hypnosis could be part of that for the people who will respond to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, This is not yeah. an emergency. You can get through it and this can help you learn that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that was part of the reason why, um, well, it's part of the reason that my name was became what it is now. And it was part of the reason why I started to create the whispers as well, because mm-hmm. I knew that you could have quite a profound effect in a relatively short space of time on somebody through giving just something because not everybody can cope with like you say uh it's all right you know you're you're gonna be okay sometimes there's just that neediness of i i I need something a bit more i need i need Mm -hmm. something that's just gonna take away the the sharp edges of this because um well, as you know, you, you, you see this yourself, you know, you don't need me to boil your cabbage for you. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a, seems like quite a Scottish saying. I'm going to use that's that. That's a Scottish saying. Yeah. I'm not going to boil your cabbage for you. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about, uh, and this is great. Again, I, I appreciate this so much. <clears throat> Hopefully you guys are learning from this, but now uh, as a consumer of therapy, of therapeutic services, mm-hmm. regardless of the U S Scotland, it doesn't matter. What, what should I be looking for? Well, um, it's interesting because in in the UK we have NICE, who are um, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellent, and the excellent, sorry, and they wrote guidelines. Okay, and I want to refer back to those guidelines because these are the ones that I practice by that I have listed on my website and they basically they they do recognize um complementary or or alternative therapies of which hypnotherapy falls under the bracket of in the treatment of anxiety disorders however they act they actually discourage the use of hypnotherapy without utilizing medical medication first or at the same time Mm -hmm. 
so what they're trying to do there, I think my interpretation of this is they're trying to discourage people from thinking that they should be using hypnotherapy as a standalone therapy. That makes sense. Right. That's yeah. my, that's my interpretation of that. Go and get yourself checked over mm -hmm. by somebody and get yourself set up with some help, psychological help and use hypnotherapy as part of a program. That's, yeah. That's very sound advice. <clears throat> Can't really argue with that. And they're not explicit in that because there are a lot of um, people who hypnotherapy is what they practice. And I'm not here to discredit any practitioners of hypnotherapy because I know fantastic practitioners of hypnotherapy and that is what they do. Mm -hmm. But I also know that their clients are working with other people as well as part of a multidisciplinary approach. Right. Okay. So it's not a case of go and find a psychotherapist who happens to practice hypnotherapy. That is absolutely something that you can do. And if you get that combination, that's yeah. great. Okay. You can see a hypnotherapist and you can see another therapist and you can have your functional doctor or whoever else you happen to be seeing. Yeah. Um, but I would be certainly looking for somebody who has um, knowledge, specific specialist knowledge of your anxiety disorder yeah. and working practice of helping people with that. And I would certainly be asking the hypnotherapist if they create their own scripts, because this is another important thing. You can buy scripts in a book and you could read those scripts but you could have practitioners reading the same scripts. Okay. You don't want the same script read to you. You want something that tackles your fear mm -hmm. using words that make sense to your head. And you want that tailored to what your needs are. And you should be always keen to make sure that your um, therapist takes the time to record your session for you and offers you that so that you can take that with you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And hypnotherapy for the treatment, it's not anxiety so multifaceted. So it's not a case of a generic anxiety hypnotherapy session. It needs to tackle the problem in different chunks, just the way that you would in a psychotherapy right. treatment program. Yeah. Okay. okay. So if somebody's saying to you, here's your recording for anxiety, that's it. Just be a bit cautious about accepting that that is it, because the chances are that's not it. That's something that's been given to you off the shelf mm -hmm. rather than created for you specifically. I sometimes do see that. Now, people will bring me, I can never pass judgment because I don't know enough, you know, and I wouldn't do that. But sometimes it is that like, well, I was offered, you know, it's four sessions, it's a thousand dollars, you know, or $700 and it's four sessions. And I'm good. That sort of sounds like the generic kind of thing. Okay. No problem. Mm -hmm. Those of you watching the I... video can read eyes. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Just so, I, my, my caution would always be, you know, people charge a lot of money for things nowadays and Part of the reason is because they sometimes put the onus of the fact that these things don't work back onto the the user. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, that boils my cabbage a wee bit. <laughs> and um, just always be careful if people are offering you packages at very large prices, especially any coaches or any, any yeah. therapists, because um you you want to make sure that you've got an outcome yeah and i could see where train the way you are and you encounter that resistant person or somebody who just doesn't respond to hypnosis it's not the only tool you have in your kit which makes a huge difference if all i have is hypnosis and it doesn't mm -hmm. work it took a thousand dollars and now i have to come to account on that so i could see where that would be a little bit of a tenuous situation get it yeah yeah mm -hmm. right. makes sense mm -hmm. 
So, so we yeah. won't go too much longer, but give me a rough idea because I know everybody wants to know. So now you're in session. What does it look like? I think so many people like, is there a moment where it's like, okay, now we're going to do hypnosis? Is there, is it an actual, I'm probably asking you a huge question that you cannot answer in five minutes. But. No, it's, it's, um, it's a lovely, gentle process. Um, if you're anxious before having your hypnosis, that's really normal. It's very common. Yeah. Um, some therapists, if you're in the room with them, might put headphones on you. They might put you in a chair that slightly reclines. They might offer you um, the warmth of a blanket because sometimes you will be lying there for 40, 50 minutes and you can get a bit um, cool around the edges. Um, you will be taken through uh, what we call the induction and then there will be an, a deepener and these are just terms that we use to kind of chunk down the process of getting somebody into a more relaxed state and it's quite often the case that your mind might wander and you might wonder well is this working is it happening are we there yet um, and your head will have thoughts that come in and you might lie there and think this isn't working <laughs> but the practitioner should be reminding you that it's okay for that to be the case that thoughts do come into our minds and um, ultimately what you should feel is um, your body starts to feel a bit heavy and your head starts to follow along with what the therapist is guiding you through and it's a very visual um process you won't fall asleep you will be conscious throughout it and then you will come to a point where you'll be getting counted up from what will have been your trance and interwoven into that session will have been um suggestions for how you can hopefully move forward from whatever it is that you're trying to deal with during the session. Mm. It's always worthwhile making sure before you do the session that you understand what the output of that session is going to be. Okay. Um, and just to make sure that following the session, you drink a nice bit of water and that you have a, a quite quiet and steady day. That You took the mystery right out of it. I it's not it's really just you know it's it's just a wee storytelling session ultimately oh. um always with a lovely ending and it's just quite pleasant it's it's a good way to spend a day and you know i used to really particularly enjoy um my sessions when i my anxiety was really high and um, my ocd was awful and I used to go and my, my therapist would do exactly what I've described to you. And I, I would get to the end and I'd be thinking, oh, just start over again, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best break I've had in three days. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I got to believe just the effectiveness of that, just giving somebody a break where they can come mm -hmm. away from it for an hour or whatever the session is, that by itself would be worth the price of admission. Even if that was all it accomplished, I think for many people, they'd be thrilled with. Yeah, yeah. totally. I yeah. mean, that's... That's the best bit about it is you do at the end, you go, oh, thank God. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's that sense of relief. And, um, but then obviously, you know, there's that part which I know you're not going to want to end on, which is the anxiety mm. at some point will, will surface again. And that's where people get into the whole, it's not worked. It didn't work. Yeah, I get yeah, it. but it's not that it hasn't worked. It has worked. It has helped. It's just that, as you know, Drew, sometimes the layers of recovery or healing that we go through are just so yeah. subtle and gentle. And we it's like painting paint on a wall. You've just got to keep going until the color that you want gets there. And yeah, yeah. I think the lesson you could take out of that session too, you might end the session. It's like going to a chiropractor. Wow, my back feels great. And then the next day, not so much, but you know, I think what you might be able to take out of the session and you tell me if this is, seems right to you, but look, I, I can be okay. I don't necessarily think that I, yeah. I need Emma all the time to make me okay, but this can teach me that I can get through things. I am capable of achieving that sort of state. Mm -hmm. I can do this. I'm not broken. Yeah. Which would be a wonderful message for somebody to be yeah. able to actually experience instead of just hear. That's great. Yeah. So I think that's it. And I think the part that I used to look forward to was because I knew I was going to get some relief. 
Yeah. And when you know that you're going to get relief, oh my yeah. goodness, it's, it's something else, especially, yeah. you know, if you've got really intense symptoms. And that you can, relief is possible. Like yeah. that is such a beacon of hope for so many people. Like nothing is going to work. Well, forget if it works, but look, it is possible for you to make distance between you and this thing. It can happen. Yeah. So. That's great. Absolutely. And just, you know, although the, the the hypnotherapy, you might not, you know, 10% I'm saying about being, are able to be hypnotized, you'll still benefit from the relaxation of the experience anyway. Yeah, I would think. I mean, hell, I want to come to Scotland and hang out with you for an hour no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and this was really so great. You were so incredibly, I like really enjoyed the conversation. I learned so much that I didn't know before and I feel more intelligent and well-informed, but I really wanted somebody that I knew I could trust to talk about this and you came through with flying colors. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's you're been wonderful welcome. to see you again. If uh, you guys want to find Emma, I have a, if you're watching on YouTube, I have her Instagram on my screen. It's the dot anxiety dot whisperer. But if you go to the anxious truth.com slash two, three, two, right. That's the show notes for this one. Yeah. Um, I'll make sure I have all M's links on there too. And I'll be back in a few minutes. We'll wrap it up like we usually do. Thanks, Em. Cheers. <laughs> all right. We are back. And that was awesome. I learned so much today about a topic that I knew nothing about this morning. And any day that you can learn something new, you are winning. And this is why I love to collaborate with people that are smarter and more than experienced than me in certain topics. Emma was great. She gave of her time on a Friday evening in Scotland because she's four hours ahead of me now. Uh, she gave of her experience and her training and her knowledge. And I appreciate all of that. What did we learn? We learned that hypnosis does in fact have a place. It could have a place as a tool as part of anxiety recovery. We also learned that hypnosis is not anxiety recovery or an anxiety cure by itself. Emma was so honest and so upfront about that, that 10% statistic blew me away. But we do know that it could be a tool and why not take advantage of tools if they are going to help us along the way in this journey, right? So I think that was really great and I appreciated it. And uh, yeah, I'll have to do more stuff with Emma for sure because she's just good and she has a lot to offer and uh, I think you, people just dig her anyway. So it's really great. If you wanna find Emma and follow along with her, which I recommend you do, I will have all of her links to social media and everything on my website. Just go to the anxious truth.com slash two, three, two. That's the show notes for this particular episode. I will link all Emma's stuff there. It's easy to find. And that's episode two thirty two in the books. You know, it's over because the music that is afterglow. It's the song you hear most of the time at the beginning, all the time at the end of these podcasts. It's written by my friend, Ben Drake. He lets me use it on the podcast. I appreciate that. You can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. Go check that out. And the usual favors that I'm going to ask you, if you're listening to the podcast on Apple or Spotify or a platform that lets you rate and review, leave a five-star rating and then maybe take a second and write a review if you haven't before. Because if you like the podcast and you say that, then other people will find the podcast and we could help more people, which is what this community is all about. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my channel, like the video, hit the notification bell. You know the deal. And if you have a question, leave a comment. I circle back a couple of times a week to interact on YouTube. I dig you guys over there. That's it. I hope this helped you and educated you as much as it educated me. I'll be back next week to talk about something else. I don't know what that is going to be, but I will be here. And remember, if Emma's listening, she's going to kick out of this. As I say at the end of every podcast, this is the way. Yeah, y'all doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast No looking back or dwelling on the past You know you'll never get another chance So go and live your life Yeah